So, I'd like to start off this presentation uh, obviously thanking the uh, brethren of Ezekiel Bates Lodge for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I always like Masonicon here. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to mix the fun aspects of Freemasonry with the, uh, the education, and uh, that's very important, both of them. So, I'm going to start this presentation off with a question. Name, uh, start yelling them out, uh, an artist from the Renaissance. Raphael. Raphael. Michelangelo. Caravaggio, ooh, Botticelli, Da Vinci, Leonardo, Brutaleski, <laughs> cheater. <laughs> so, so almost every time I do this, I hear the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, and uh, yeah, rightly so, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, Michelangelo are all very influential uh, members of the Renaissance artist community. But they all pale in comparison to what one man named Brunelleschi uh, accomplished, and that's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> All right, Filippo Derso Brunelleschi de Lapalippi. That's his name. Don't say that again. And actually, if you um, take apart this name, you, um, it actually is very simple. I go. Um, Filippo di Ser Brunelleschi, or Brunellesco means Filippo, son of Ser Brunellesco, who is son of Lapalippi. So, we call him Filippo Brunelleschi, which actually wasn't his name when he was going around. In fact, his nickname back then was Pippo. Um, so this guy is, uh, what I, what, as I said before, is the person probably res responsible for the Renaissance. And how is he, uh, let's talk about him first of all before how he got into it. So he was born in 1377. He died April 15th, 1446. Um, little is known of his early life. Um, his father was a lawyer and um, kind of a statesman uh, who achieved a, a good amount of wealth, nothing absolutely crazy like the Medici, but he was well known in Florence. Uh, Florence's uh, government was based on the guild system. You had to be a member of basically a, um, like a labor union and be high up in that labor union to be allowed to be governing the, the city, which only happened in three-month increments. Every three months, they would change the leader of the city, and hopefully that would produce some sort of activity on the government level, which, of course, it really didn't. <laughs> um, right. Brunelleschi was born into a family of civil servants, like his father. And in the Middle Ages, um, your profession was ordained at birth. Um, if your father was a certain kind of tradesman, that is what you were going to be. And um, unfortunately, if you take that... Uh, Logically, you start to discover uh, some of the myths of Freemasonry. Uh, the myths of stonemasons being able to travel around and use secret handshakes to tell everybody that that was their skill set in uh, cutting stone. It's simply not true, unfortunately. Uh, so stonemasons were the son of stonemasons, and buildings usually took centuries to complete. You didn't really travel a lot to... Um, go to different building sites and prove that you were a mason by a cool password. Uh, the first time we have that in history is actually in the 18th century and early 19th century when Freemasonry already existed and it first shows up in Scotland. But Filippo is a little bit of an oddity with this and it really happens down to where he was born, Florence. So he was originally trained for civil service but as with all artistic minds you realize that numbers and being organized is just not your thing. <laughs> Um, you, people joke about, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really good at uh, painting. Yeah, well, you should see me do math and you'll never, <laughs> never call me awesome ever again. Um, and that was kind of what was going on with Filippo. He was extremely artistic from a birth. And his father realized that. He realized that he wasn't going to be able to um, go into the family business. So he signs him up to study as a goldsmith. Now, in the Renaissance, or this is actually considered the proto-Renaissance, the beginning of the Renaissance, um, goldsmiths were the creme de la creme of sculpting. You paid people based on the materials in which they used. So stonemasons actually didn't get paid a lot of money. Uh, goldsmiths, on the other hand, did. And goldsmiths typically worked for uh, churches, 
uh, doing uh, icons and other uh, implements that would be used in the mass at that time, or they would work for the ultra rich. Filippo uh, went into this business and is actually recorded as a master goldsmith at 21 which is actually a little bit late for what that was. Usually apprentices in any guild would start around 13 and spend about five or six years developing that skill before they produce their masterpiece, which is where we get the term that we use today. You would have to produce a piece of work that proved you were a master of your trade. That's why we call them masterpieces now. It just kind of evolved into what we call it now. Um, so why do we need to talk about them? Well, he had two major accomplishments. Uh, one is he discovered and calculated linear perspective. And two, what he did for architecture, which is reinvented. So let's talk about the first one, linear perspective. Does anybody actually know what linear perspective is? Anybody ever heard of it? Okay, we got a couple of hands, so this won't be too bad. Um, linear perspective is the proper way to represent three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional plane. And here is a perfect example of how not to do that. <laughs> if you look at this, this is part of a uh, altarpiece. If you look at the space, it doesn't look right, right? Like, it, it just seems odd. Like, the person sitting on the crown is huge. Like, it doesn't make sense that he would be that much bigger behind all these other people. He's probably like 10 feet tall. But if you also look at the space of this painting, the room doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like the table is, is right. And that is because perspective and the way that the human eye and the brain figures out linear, uh, excuse me, cubic space is based on geometry. And that's what Filippo was about to discover. So, uh, oh wait, yeah, I need you, but cool. Uh, here's another example. This is Madonna and Child and Throne by Giotto. Giotto was one of the key figures of painting in the Proto-Renaissance. If you look at it, the space yet again doesn't seem right. The people behind other people are the same size. They're just lifted up so you can see their heads poking out. Um, if you look at her chair, the angles don't make a lot of sense. It, it, they, they're just painting what they think is a chair, not actually representing how it would look naturally. And that's the big concept that changed in the Renaissance. People started realizing that observation and putting your own scientific method into those observations was the new big thing. It wasn't about iconography anymore. It was actually about the human relationship to nature and understanding that relationship. And that's what Filippo uh, starts to discover. And the way he discovers it is with this building. This is the Baptistry of Florence. Um, it is, as you can see, it's an octagonal shape and it's a building that is directly across from the main doors of the, the um, Duomo of Florence or Cathedral of Florence. It's a beautiful building. It was built in, te uh, in the 11th century. I was going to say the original date, but I know I'd butcher it. Um, it's, it's gigantic. Those doors that you're looking at there are 16 feet tall uh, and made of solid bronze. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But what he noticed when he looked at this building is if you see the lines, they seem to form a pattern. Like when, now remember, all of these these walls are the same level. Those lines are all perfectly horizontal to the ground. But because they're going back in the background, they seem to have a specific kind of angle that's going away from them. Bruno Eschi decided that he wanted to explore that more and see if there was any kind of pattern. By the way, there's a rumor and uh, a kind of uh, myth that goes around that any person who goes inside the baptistry, they immediately would look up in the air as a sign of reverence to God. It might be reverence or it might be that ceiling. <laughs> um, that is the ceiling inside this Duomo. This is where Michelangelo, Dante, and most of the other Florentine um, legends, I guess you could say, were all baptized. And if you look up, you see this amazing uh, mosaic, uh, which is Christ doing the last judgment. So you see Christ down here in the east, and he has one hand uh, facing down, one hand facing up. He's lifting some to heaven and pushing other ones down to hell. It's a typical symbol in Renaissance art. But I just wanted to show you that because it's absolutely stunning to get in there. And a lot of people skip it if they go to Florence. They don't think to go in that building. Go in that building. So what he does is he takes this building, and I, I'm going to make a negative of it so you can see it. And he decided that if he <coughs> took the lines that we see here and created a horizontal space or a horizon line, like where everything just uh, disappears into the horizon, and take those lines, 
he notices something. They all converge on one specific spot, or in this case, two specific spots. And what he here has identified is perspective. This is two-point perspective. Everything on this structure falls into the horizon line on two very specific points. Now, that's just one part. The other thing that he has to develop is, all right, well, if these archways are all the same size, there must be a ratio that of the difference of the size as it goes back into the foreground and into the background. And that is what he sets out to discover. And he does this with this ingenious little uh, um, uh, experiment, which I'm going to try to explain, but here you go. Um, here, again, is just the two different uh, kinds of perspective. Here we have one point perspective, like you're looking down a road on a flat route. Everything converges because of your eye into a single point. This is two point. So you now you're looking at an angle and it goes off. But this is uni uh, universal when every time you look at something. Me looking right now at this lodge room, all the lines would converge on a horizon line right now. It's just the way we identify space. So moving next. The way he discovers this and the way he proves that this is true is he comes up with this crazy invention to help him purposely see math next to nature. And what he does is he paints an extremely realistic painting of that baptistry. And he makes the, ceiling, the uh, sky a mirror. <laughs> then he drills a hole in it and he holds up another mirror. So he's holding it like this. So what he's looking at is the reflection of his own um, painting in the mirror and then nature next to it. And by swinging the mirror, he could see if these lines that he mathematically produced would line up and lo and behold, they did. This small experiment changes art instantaneously and dives into the Renaissance. It is immediate, he does this very public, he does it in the middle of the cathedral so everybody can see it and of course he shows everybody because he's got an ego the size of a dinosaur and people start mimicking it instantaneously. For example, Masaccio, who is an artist who was living around the same time, one of the first Renaissance painters, uses this. Look at the buildings behind him. Looks realistic now, right? Things have kind of finally tuned out correctly and we're getting a good sense of space. Also with this, we invent a new kind of symbolism. So if we were to take the vanishing points here and do it, they converge on the head of Christ. Now we have geometric symbolism in art. Now, the most important figure in this painting is not only Christ for the meaning of the painting, but the actual physics of the scene are all now related to the head of Christ, bringing even more symbolism to it. And that continues with other paintings as well. Did you ever look at the, the, the angles that are produced in the background of the, the, uh, the Last Supper? Where do they converge? Christ's head. He is the central and most important part of this painting, not only symbolically, but geometrically and uh, artistically. This changes art forever. We use this every day from now on, and it's still um, something that is taught in art school day one. And the proper way to do this is strictly through basic geometry, which uh, hopefully some of the art, uh, uh, Freemasons in here will appreciate. So, the other thing that he does is become a master architect, and I truly mean master. He, uh, he uh, comes up with it, well, he is given the title of Campermistro, which in Italian is master builder. Um, sometimes it can be translated to master of the compasses um, because of the geometry and, uh, and um, other ideas that he puts into his designs. So, how does this all begin? Well, in 1401, there was a competition that changed history. There's a fantastic book on this competition called The Feud That Sparked the Renaissance. And what it was, was that uh, Florence had just gotten out of a plague. And in order to appease God and ask for that plague never to come back, they com the, uh, the Gilda de Lana, or the Opera de Lana, which is a guild, one of those uh, labor unions that I was talking about, for the wool merchants, which was the most expensive and most powerful um, guilds in the city, decided that they were going to commission new doors for the baptistry. And like tradition, um, they held a competition to see who would win these, this competition of these doors. And it came down to two people, Brunelleschi and Lorenzo Ghiberti. 
which these two guys from this point on will hate each other for the rest of their life. Um, and rightly so. Brunelleschi uh, is obviously a genius when it comes to physics and um, the observation of certain things. Lorenzo Ghiberti is an artistic mastermind. The way he can manipulate uh, sculpture is incredible and is duplicated even to this day. So what it comes down to is that a competition was held and people had to build these roses that would go presumably on the door. They were given a certain subject, the sacrifice of Isaac. They were given 70 pounds of bronze. And they were told that certain things had to be in it. They had to have the donkey, they had to have an angel, and they had to come up with their own way of doing it. And these are the actual pieces of that competition that still exist. You can go see them in the Bargello Museum in Florence. Brunelleschi's on the left and Ghiberti's on the right. Who do you think wins? Ghiberti. Ghiberti wins. And he rightly does so. His piece, there's more action to it. It's more dynamic. It's more visually stimulating. He also works amazing patinas into this. So what happens? What does Brunelleschi do? Well, he does what any sane artist would do. He storms, gets mad, and leaves, and never, says he's never coming back. Um, it's actually funny. If you read the biography of Brunelleschi that he commissioned, we find that there's actually two sides of the story. The one written down in the actual records of Florence shows that Lorenzo Ghiberti clearly won. But if you read Brunelleschi's biography, he states that, well, they couldn't pick the two of us, so they gave it to both of us. But me, being the great Brunelleschi, I would never share a commission with such a person. So I said, both of us or none of us? And they said, no. So I said, no, you're not good enough for me. And I walked away off to greater glories. That's the only bit of evidence that actually happened. <laughs> so what does Brunelleschi do? Oh, excuse me, what does Ghiberti do first? Ghiberti creates these, which Michelangelo later on calls the Gates of Paradise, and they are rightly named so. As I said before, they're 16 feet high, multiple tons, all hanging on specifically designed hinges so that you can open the door with a push of the finger, and you still can today. And the scenes are incredible. Uh, this took the rest of Ghiberti's life to create these. We can go to the next one. He even took ideas from Brunelleschi and put them back into them, as he rightly should. This is the marriage of Mary and Joseph. And you can see that one point perspective going right down, right into the womb of Mary here. But look at the intricacy of these things. It's unbelievable. Um, you can see these, well, you can see um, uh, replicas which are still in their existing plates, or there's a museum in Florence called the Opera of the Duomo where you can actually see the original ones that are in there. And they are that stunning still to this day. So Brunelleschi storms out and goes away. And he disappears, really, for 18 years. Now, many things have been speculated about what he did. Uh, we know, well, we think that he traveled east and south, outside of Italy, to learn certain things. Um, and we think that he was formally educated outside of Italy just because of the knowledge he comes back with. What we do know is he traveled to Rome with his close friend Donatello. And when I say close friend, I really mean close friend. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, and I don't mention that because I need I, I, the need to do that, but there is very strong evidence that Brunelleschi and Donatello were lovers. And the reason why I bring that up is not just to say, oh, look, someone was gay. It's that these people were both artistic masterminds, and they worked together, and they understood, and they studied together. So the skills of one, Donatello, for example, who is probably one of the greatest sculptors in history, and Brunelleschi, one of the greatest architectural minds in history, they interlap. And you could tell by what they were producing in the certain time frames that they were learning off of each other as they go. We even have direct evidence of lovers' quarrels where they didn't like each other's work and broke up for a couple of times. But the reason I bring it up again is it's very important to understand that these two guys were working with each other on a level that no one else was doing at the time. So he studied the Greeks, including Pythagoras, Vitruvius, uh, who is actually Roman, um, and the Italian Fibonacci. And he starts learning about math and learning about ratios. And it's important to notice that there's a difference between math and geometry. Math is based off of numbers. Geometry is based off of ratios. Ratios are universal. Math is not. If I say I'm measuring a block of wood 10 feet wide or 10 inches wide, back then there was no universal system of membership ten, uh, of uh, measurement. 10 inches in Florence was completely different than 10 inches in, in Paris, for example. So geometry, by using a 2 to 1 ratio, a 3 to 1 ratio, is universal no matter where you go. 
So, and the last thing that he did, which is probably the most important, is he took extreme care in studying the secrets of the uh, Pantheon. This is the Pantheon as it stands today. It's a 2,000 year old structure that you can still go in. It's the oldest church in uh, Rome, and it's also home to a massive dome, a dome with an oculus at the top of it, like a giant hole where rain and anything could come in. But what Brunelleschi was really discovering about this is how it was built. And the, now, as I said, this was built by the Romans, and it was built using concrete, which was forgotten. No one knew how to use uh, concrete at this time. But what Brunelleschi was noticing was there was other aspects to the structure that weren't based on the concrete that makes it stand. For example, the walls at the bottom are 23 feet thick. And at the top, they're a mere couple of feet thick. And the reason why is it was hiding the structural elements inside the building itself without the use of buttresses, which was the big thing and the big rave at this time. Flying buttresses, as most of you know, are those big joints that stick out of Gothic cathedrals. They're very unsightly. They're, they tend to crack. And um, because of Florence's political side, Florence did not want anything to do with that because their rivals were using them in everything they do. Brunelleschi is seeing such a structure being built without any use of that stuff. So he actually gets in and he climbs in and he starts chipping away at the roof of this thing to figure out how it's made. And he realizes that there's hard stone at the bottom and then there's light stone at the top. And at the very top, it's filled with empty pots to keep the weight down. So he's discovering that a system of weights can be used instead of external support systems to make this work. So he starts discover, uh, starts being an architect. And I'm going to jump around time frame wise here just because I wanted to show you some of his key uh, structures. And then we're going to get to the big one at the end. Uh, first of all, this is the Ospitale de Innocente, which is the, um, the Hospital of the Innocents. This building was set up in Florence at this time for abandoned babies. In fact, to this day, there is a stone table outside with baby cloths and pillows. If you don't want your baby in Florence, you ring a bell a buzzer which calls people inside and you can leave your baby there no questions asked and the, and the, the uh, convent with there will take care of that baby and find it a new home. This was huge back then in Florence because if you had an, uh, a bastard child you were out. You were exonerated from all of society and it was basically political suicide for you to do such. Um, so what he designs here is this, this it looks like an extremely simple structure, but it's all based on geometry and not a whim like other designs were. So if we look at the facade, he uses this three to one ratio in everything that you see. So for example, what I mean by three to one is um, there's three, two thirds of the arch are controlled by one third of the top. So this arch is exactly one third of everything that you see here. And the entire structure is based off of this one ratio. Now this is a very simplistic uh, um, example of this kind of style. And I wanted to show you because it shows you the base of it, uh, the basics of what he was doing. But if we go to the next one, which is the Pazzi Chapel, which is one of his masterpieces, we now see geometry being used in every aspect of the build. He basically picks a point, picks a ratio, and goes with it and see where it pops up. For example, this ratio was built as based off of Fibonacci. Fibonacci sequence is 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Basically, you add the number before it, and you come up with the spiral, which is called the golden spiral or the golden ratio. And he uses this to determine where different aspects of the build go up. As I said, he's not really designing anything. He's just kind of letting geometry lead him in, down the path. And what comes out is using a compass and strategic points is this beautiful, ornate building which naturally ties itself together when you look at it. The perfect example of that is if you look from the base of the dome down. Look at how the geometry mimics itself. It's like he took this, then folded it out, then folded it up, then folded it up onto the wall. And it creates this harmonious uh, area which he considered the divine because it was only using geometry. So, the big thing that he did, the great story of Brunelleschi is this. Santa Maria del Fiore, which was begin, in, uh, begin building in 1296, and we're going to start the story at 14, uh, 1418. This is the Duomo of Florence, the great cathedral. It was designed to have a giant dome on the front of it, uh, in the middle of it, but no one knew how to build it. 
So what did they do? Like any responsible architect, they said, well, screw it, we're just gonna build it anyway and hope someone else can figure this out. And that's exactly what they did. If you look at old uh, representations of it, this fresco was done before the dome was designed. And we have this random dome up here and that's kind of how people envisioned what it was gonna look like. But yet again, no one knew how to do that. So what was so horrible about this dome? Well, it would be the largest masonry dome in the world. Uh, the base of the dome was 171 feet up in the air. Uh, it was 140 foot, 44 feet wide right now, and there wasn't enough timber in all of Italy to build the scaffold. That's how big it is. And the base of the dome, thanks to some ingenious builders, wasn't even centered correctly. So we had an off-center building that was 175, 171 feet up in the air, and no one knew how to span that. So what was proposed? Um, one huge column in the middle, <laughs> okay, that's one thing, that's a huge column. Uh, fill the church with dirt, then build on top of the dirt. Hey, you laugh, but it was done throughout Europe up until this point. It was the way they figured out how to build supports. My favorite one is, all right, we're going to fill it with dirt, but we're going to shove all these gold coins in the dirt. And then when we're done, we let all the poor people come in and dig out the dirt. <laughs> They're like, free labor. That's ingenious. <laughs> um, the other one was plant a forest, let the trees grow. In 100 years, we try again. And then finally, they did what any responsible person would do, is they said, well, why do we have to figure it out? It's someone else's problem. Let's pay someone else to figure this out. And that's what they did. So on August 19th, 1418, this was posted around town. I'm not going to read it for you, but um, basically it's saying, I'm going to give you 200 florins if you can figure out how to do that. And that was a huge sum of money back then. That was more than a few years' salary. So, this is where the egg comes in, the famous story of Brunelleschi. So, a lot of people come in and say, I have ideas, and they're all okay, but they don't solve all of the problems. Brunelleschi, who had a bit of an ego, comes in, and he goes up to the guild and says, I have a plan, and it's going to work, and this is how I'm going to do it. And he kind of lays it out, and the people who are involved, including Cosimo Medici, who was probably the most, pers uh, most important person in Florence, kind of say, yeah, you, no. <laughs> so Brunelleschi takes out a couple of eggs, and he hands them out to the people on the board, and he says, all right, I want you to stand this egg up on its end and balance it on this table, and if you figure out how to do that, then you will understand how I'm going to build this. Okay, now this is probably a myth. I don't think there's actual evidence, but the story's fantastic. So they all take their eggs out and they start playing like that and obviously they can't balance an egg and they say, fine, Brunelleschi, why don't you show us how to do it? And he takes his head and he goes, and he cracks it and he puts it on the door and it stands up on its end because he's broken the bottom part. And the people who are in charge of the, uh, the dome say, well, that's easy. Anybody could do that. We didn't know we could do that. And he goes, aha, that's what you're going to say when I show you how I'm going to build this dome. I don't know if that's a kind of true. That's a lot of money to rest on a broken egg, but it's a, it's a famous myth that has on. So what does he actually propose? He wins the commission, and he proposes something incredible, that he's not going to build a dome. He's going to build two domes, and he's going to use no centering beam. That's unnecessary. He's not going to use any scaffolding. Think about that. This is, how is he going to do this? And you know what? That dome that we built, it's not tall enough. I want to build it bigger. And he would not tell anybody about the physics of how he was doing this. He said, I have a plan. I know this is going to work. I know the math. I know the science. It's going to work. This is monumental because up until this point, most uh, construction of cathedrals, despite what we are taught, was mostly guessing. That's where flying buttresses came in. Things fell into itself. That didn't work. Arches became pointed because they were more stable. Brunelleschi is not saying that he is going to do guesswork. He says, I know this is going to work, and this is how I'm going to do it. That's revolutionary when it comes to architecture. So what does he propose? He proposes this. Basically, in a nutshell, we have two domes. One just like the Pantheon that we see here. At the base, it's incredibly thick, and it gets thinner as it gets on top. And then there's a dome on the outside of it. And that dome rests upon that dome and supports one another. Think of a barrel. And what else he realizes is the oculus. Remember that oculus I was telling you about, that big hole in the, um, 
uh, top of the Pantheon. Well, what he realizes, oh, excuse me, uh, I'll go to this first. Yeah, uh, we can go to the next one. He also realizes that there's a lot of wasted money when it comes to building things. And one of the biggest things that cost money was time. Hauling bricks up to the top re required a hoist. And the way those hoists would work would you'd have 10 or 15 oxen ro rotating this big crank, which would ho haul up a huge brick. And when it got up, you'd put a brake in there, you'd take the oxen off, and then you'd put the oxen in the other way because they can't walk backwards, and then you'd bring it down slowly that way. He says, no, I've been a clockmaker, I've been a goldsmith, I have a fix, and he invents the transmission. Now, this is such a monumental uh, change that da Vinci, who wrote these sketches, was actually credited at us for a couple hundred years because they thought only da Vinci would have come up with something like this. But all he's doing is, if you see, is if he moves up and down, he can reverse with one motion the direction without changing out the oxen. You just saved hours, if not years, of work when it comes to a building of this structure. Okay, so the oculus, what I was telling you about. What he realized is we don't need a keystone when it comes to a dome. The dome itself can be its own keystone. Think of the oculus. There's nothing up there, but what's holding everything in place is that actual ring of the oculus. That's the keystone. So if I can do it at the top, why can't I do it at the sides while we're building it? As long as I keep building oculuses up, 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 it'll hold itself up. So how does he do this? This is where the genius of Brunelleschi comes in. The first thing he designs is a completely new way of laying bricks. And he calls it a herringbone, or we call it a herringbone pattern. But basically what it is, is every step has a brick that's laying on its side. And then it would move up one brick. And what that does is instead of directing all the weight through the bricks down around the edge, it actually spirals the weight around the building, directing all the force away from the pressure points, but on itself as it goes. So now we have a self-supporting brick dome that is going to be created. Then he could rest the other dome on top of this. The next thing he, he figures out, how do I hold bricks at incredible angles in place? And this is actually a very simple uh, uh, way of doing this. By putting force through weights and pulleys, you can actually push the bricks into place without actually having to uh, build anything else. So if you think about this, where is the weight of that brick now? Is it falling straight down or is it going back in? It's always forcing itself back into the correct spot. Okay. And finally, the big things that go into this. So there's a couple of steps. We have the brickwork that we just discovered, and he starts building ribs up here. And if you can see, the ribs kind of um, lock everything into place with certain different styles of brick. So he's using marble in place of the bricks to kind of lock everything in like a beehive. That's the easiest way to describe it. He also invents these stone and metal rings that hold the thing together like a barrel. So every like 20 feet he would go up, he would create one of these rings. Think of it exactly like I said, like a barrel. The barrel rings hold the barrel in place. The pressure of the water pushes out, but the rings kind of hold it together, and you don't have to worry about structural. He's just building oculuses. That's all he's doing. The interesting thing about this is, in his notes, or what the records of his notes that we have, he says that he used wooden and metal and wood, metal and and um, stone rings to do this. Well, in the 90s they decided that they wanted to see where these metal ones. When you walk up into the dome, you can see the wooden ones, you can see the, the stone ones, but you can't see the metal ones, and they wanted to know where it was. Lo and behold, they couldn't find any. They used metal detectors everywhere. So there is a suspicion that in his notes and him trying to hide how he was doing this, he would invent things that were unnecessary just to make sure that people couldn't figure out and duplicate it, or in other words, fire him and hire someone cheaper. And I bring that up for a reason, because remember his uh, rival, Ghiberti? Ghiberti tried to keep busting in on this and trying to get over. Oh, look what he's doing. He's going to kill us all. I'm going to take over the job. I know what it's going to, I know how to fix this. Okay. They bring him in. He doesn't know what he's doing. And the, one of the great stories of Brunelleschi is um, when everybody realized that Ghiberti didn't know what he was doing, um, they went back to Brunelleschi and said, like, could you help out? And all of a sudden, Brunelleschi was on his deathbed. And it wasn't looking good. <laughs> and um, they didn't, he wasn't going to tell the secrets. So they decided to hire him again. And lo and behold, the greatest miraculous uh, he uh, healing in all of the Italy would happen. And he'd be back on the job to save the day. So what he creates 
finally, and, and here is um, what the two domes. This is actually not historically accurate, but it's a great description of where this staircase is. He builds a staircase in between. So as they're working on it, they're actually working inside the dome. No scaffolding. He actually builds a little bit of a platform so they can't see down. And because of that, safety increases. In fact, with this build, which took over 20 years, um, only three people died. And this is in the 1400s. So that is incredible. What he accomplishes is this. It is still the largest masonry dome in the world. Um, we still do not fully understand how he did it. Um, he made it to when the dome was actually completed and another competition was held for the lantern, which he won, but he unfortunately passed away before it. Um, but as you can see, um, it still stands strong. There are some cracks in it. There were some major cracks during a renovation earlier where he created these portholes on the side to let the building breathe. Some people thought that was not fairly aesthetically pleasing, clogged it up, and lo and behold, cracks started appearing very, sim uh, very quickly, so they were fixed. Um, the dome today, you can climb, you can go up to the top, and you can actually see all of this brickwork as you go up, and it's incredible to see like the chisel marks as you, as you go up there. Um, an interesting thing to note is this gallery here. Uh, this stonework here is actually the actual original color of the building. And throughout the ages up until the, the 19th century, people have been adding to this building. And in the, six, uh, the 1500s, an architect decided that he wanted to add a gallery going around the edge. And Michelangelo, who was walking in town, someone asked him his opinion of this, and he says it looks like a big stupid birdcage. And if Michelangelo says something looks like a birdcage, well, damn it, it looks like a birdcage, and you better stop building it. And it was abandoned. And that is why it still stands out there, because Michelangelo said it was ugly. But that is how Brunelleschi changed architecture. This one man took the guesswork of architecture beforehand and involved science, ingenuity, and engineering to create something that we in the 21st century still don't comprehend. Um, when he died, he was given the illustrious uh, honor of being buried in the cathedral, which was something that was very um, um, rare back then. And that, that tomb was actually lost until about 30 years ago when it was discovered, and I kid you not, in the gift shop. So, <laughs> so if you go down to the gift shop in the crypt of the Duomo, right next to the register, and I really mean it, right next to the register, you will see Brunelleschi's tomb. <laughs> um, if, I hope you all enjoyed this. I know uh, 15th century architecture is the lively topic of the evening. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I want to go back soon, and uh, maybe I could talk somebody to bring a 40-pound friend to come with me and climb it with me. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this presentation.